Hello, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful people. Today we are going to talk about a new America. Is that possible? Well, in the early 1900s, many Americans certainly believed that we could create a new America with the progressive movement. We will be looking specifically at the progressive movement, um, leading individuals, leading movements, uh, three presidents known as the progressive presidents, Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson. So let us commence. In our last lesson, we looked at the United States and its search for an empire. And with the defeat of the Spanish empire, we do in fact get our empire across the Pacific in parts of the Caribbean, the United States is expanding. As we leave our imperial ventures, we enter a new age. We go from the Gilded Era into the so-called Progressive Era. Today, many of us believe that key to improving society to improving things or eliminating things like child labor, crime, uh, homelessness, drug abuse. A lot of this falls on government, that through laws, through reforms, we can fix society. This is a belief among many Americans, not all Americans by any means. But in 1900, remember, the United States government was very much laissez-faire. We went over this, hands off, hands off of big business, hands off of society for the most part. The government that governs least governs best was a very, very strong feeling and belief in this country in the 1800s. As we enter the 1900s, that belief begins to weaken with the rise of a new movement, the progressive movement. What was the progressive movement? Number one, it's not a political party. Get that out of your head. There were Republican progressives and there were Democrat progressives. So take that out of the way. Not all progressives agreed on all things by any means. There was a lot of disagreement within the progressive movement. But one thing they agreed upon was that government could help to fix society's ills, that through reform, we can enter into a more civilized and just society. The United States had changed so much from the late 1800s to 1900, industrialization, urbanization, mass immigration, a lot of new problems had emerged. And many Americans, not all, believed that it was time for the government to get involved the progressive movement not just government we can have private charities and agencies as well but the overarching thing that they agreed on was the that government needed to step in to fix certain issues it builds on the populist movement the populist movement sought to eliminate price gouging from the rails from the shipping companies, um, high interest rates. They wanted more direct involvement of the people in politics. Where the populist movement ends, the progressive movement picks up. We want to, if not eliminate, we want to greatly weaken trusts, monopolies, class privilege, bribery, etc. Three presidents will be known as our progressive presidents, that is Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson. And we will look at these three men and how they contributed to the so-called progressive era. Who was the support base of the progressive movement? Well, let's go back. The populist movement support was mostly found among rural farmers. And this is one reason it doesn't succeed. However, the support base of the progressive movement is going to be much more ur urban, much more middle class, and it's going to cut across American society. And this is why it succeeds. This middle class is much more literate. They can read and write. 
And they are living in a strange time with all of these changes. They are seeing cities emerge in the millions. They are seeing new populations arriving daily. They're seeing a dramatic rise in crime, child labor, industrial strikes. They're getting nervous. They're getting nervous. Something needs to be done. Something needs to be done. And so many Americans, not all, will join in this progressive movement or at least support politicians who claim to be members of this movement. And so the support base is much wider with the progressives. That's why it works. And the progressive mo movement, roughly 1890s to 1920. 1890s to 1920. And again, historical eras don't exist with year zero, X, Y, Z. It's They blend. They blend. But for the most part, that's a pretty good uh, approximation of the dating. Now, one group of Americans who are instrumental in unnerving the middle class, making them anxious, were men and women known as muckrakers. Now, what was a muckraker? A muckraker was usually a journalist, but they could be a photographer or just an author who exposed the dirty underbelly of society. Uh, today, we have investigative reporters, right? Today, we're going to go undercover and see how teenagers are vaping in high school, right? That's exposing something that we weren't aware of, something negative. That's a muckraker. Muckrakers will write for uh, monthly magazines, periodicals, newspapers, exposing the dirty underbelly of American society. Literally, a muckraker, and this goes back to the 1700s in England, rakes the bottom of a pond or a river. You might look at this creek and go, oh, how lovely. And this is how people viewed America, right? It's beautiful. It's the Gilded Age. Beautiful mansions, land of opportunity. However, a muckraker, what a muckraker does is it exposes the dirty underside of American society, literally by raking the floor of a river or a pond, we bring up all that is ugly within society. This is what muckrakers want to do. They want to expose corruption. They want to expose child labor, crime, uh, living conditions of the city poor and rural poor. This is what they do. You might think that life is great, but what about those young kids in New York City, in Manhattan? What about uh, there's streets in New York City where you will be robbed, raped, killed. This is how the other half live. Crime is going through the roof. You might be happy in your cushy little suburb in Cincinnati, but this man is out killing people. Why? Something needs to be done. Something needs to be done. We are raking up all that is ugly and unjust in American society. And these stories, these exposés, what we call them today, creates a demand that something does in fact need to be done. The effects, as I just said, these periodicals, books, photographs, create a perceived need that the government needs to step in, that people need to step in, that hands off government and hands off society, this whole social Darwinist idea of let the strong survive and let the weak perish needs to be done away with. We need to get involved. A lot of this has to do with Christian missionary uh, 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 spirit of the 1800s. We are, as we become less religious in society, we have not given up that need to save our neighbors. And so please know that this has a lot of roots in the uh, social gospel of the 1800s. One book that is going to expose the dirty underbelly of American society uh, in major ways is Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Now, Upton Sinclair goes to Chicago. Now, we learned a little bit about Chicago and its meatpacking industry. And Upton Sinclair, what he wanted to do is expose how the workers are treated. The workers were treated terribly. The machine runs. You lose a finger. The machine keeps running. You lose uh, an arm. You're fired. You don't get compensation. Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle to expose labor conditions. But what it 
does is it creates a panic in this country because all people can read was like, wait, what happened to the finger? The machine kept running. What? Legend has it, and it's most likely not true, but I choose to believe it. Teddy Roosevelt was reading an excerpt of The Jungle whilst eating breakfast sausage. Now, we know that sausage is made up of a number of alls and ends of pig, cow, etc. And as he's snapping the sausage, and you guys know that sausage skin, you can kind of pop it, pop. He's popping the sausage in his mouth, and he's reading how in the meat industry in Chicago, they allow rats to fall into the machines, uh, rat feces, cockroaches, the occasional arm or leg, and he is getting sick to his stomach, and he demands something needs to be done. And so there is the muck rake. He works with Congress to get reform when it comes to our food and later our drugs. This is a perfect example of a story eliciting action from the government. In 1906, Congress passes the Meat Inspection Act and Pure Food and Drug Act. What this does, as the name infers, is it regulates, it regulates how our food is processed. Uh, we introduce inspectors. We introduce standards. The way that the federal government can get away with this is because all of these things are shipped interstate, and the federal government is in charge of interstate commerce. And so we want to get involved in making sure our food is safe, that our food is somewhat pure. Uh, in 1912, in 1912, we will add drugs to this, the same thing. And we will also eliminate drug companies being able to make outrageous statements, not to say they still kind of do, but it's uh, much more difficult now and they have to be much more vague. Again, we are trying to, well, we are in fact creating change when it comes to our safety. Up until now, remember, Americans had received their meat and their food locally. If they didn't grow it themselves, most did. They knew the man or woman who did. They saw the cow there one week, and the next day it was on their plate. They knew, well, it's fresh. The man, it's, it's pure. Well, now what exactly is in your corned beef from Chicago? Do you know? Ingredients that didn't have to be listed. People made outrageous claims when it came to medicine. Literally, they promised you anything. Cancer can be cured. It's sugar pills. Complete lies. Blindness can be cured. Sugar pills. Like magic, like magic, this product fixed everything with me. With these laws, you can't simply make these blind statements. In the early 1900s, there was very little regulation when it came to medicine in general. You could go down to the local chemist and pretty much get anything you needed to uh, help you in your ailments. Nerve restores, cough suppressants. Many of these ingredients were quite toxic or very, very addictive. Things like opium, cocaine, etc., do your kids stay up all night crying with sore teeth? Well, have I got the product for you, ladies and gentlemen? It's called cocaine. It's called cocaine, and it might even give them more energy around the house to perform chores. You can go down to the local chemist, the pharmacy, and get yourself some. This was America of the 1800s. Not anymore. Do you have sore muscles? Do you suffer from migraines? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I've got the fix-all. It's called heroin. Not addictive, not addictive. They gave heroin, by the way, to alcoholics to help them kick the addiction of alcohol because heroin, uh, a hero, it's a heroin, right? It's a female hero, was not addictive. Thank God, thank God. You know, I haven't had a drink of liquor in two years, but I always have my trusty heroin. Are you tired, listless? Well, forget Red Bull, have I got the tonic for you, my friend, coca wine. Yes, in fact, made with cocaine. That will keep you up all night 
busy, busy, busy. And we all know that that little pep in your step with Coca-Cola in the early years came from cocaine. Well, no longer with the government getting involved. Progressives in state government. It was actually on the state level that we see progressive politicians actually gaining success. Uh, we have California, Wisconsin that lead the way. They begin to pass laws regulating rail, uh, allowing for more citizen involvement in, 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 in the introduction of laws. What were some of the major state reforms before we get to the federal level? Well, direct primary elections. Direct primary elections emerged in the early 1900s, mostly in the West. We should be able to decide who is going to run within the party, not party bosses. We decide who our candidate will be as a political party member. The Republican people can, the Republican people, the Republicans can decide for themselves. The Democrats can decide for themselves. It's not up just to the party. We need to be involved. Number two, the secret ballot was eliminated on the state level. It had already been eliminated on the federal level, but state after state eliminates the secret ballot. Let me put my candidates envelope in the box. You don't have to do it for me at the polling station. Finally, many states introduced the initiative program or the uh, a referendum system. This allows American voters to vote on whether a law can be introduced. And then we you get enough signatures, right? 100,000 signatures. And then that goes onto the ballot. And we, the people, can decide on a new law, not just the legislature. That, of course, is on a state level. All of these things were designed to make America more democratic, less Republican, more democratic. And democracy means rule by the people, right? In a republic, we elect representatives to pass laws and initiate change. In a democracy, the people vote directly. And all of these things were supposed to be to make America more democratic. And this all comes from the progressive, uh, the uh, populist movement. Direct democracy in the states, the initiative program. Again, we are getting laws on the books for the people. We're bypassing the state legislatures, more popular in the West, as you can see, the base of the populist movement. We also have the recall process out West. All of these things, by the way, came about during the progressive era. If you don't like your governor, you get enough signatures, it goes in the ballot, and we can vote whether to fire said governor. It's happened before. President Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, our first, our first progressive president, known as the progressive president, president by some historians roosevelt's life and so this is why he's so interesting he's full of contradictions he is full of contradictions he comes from an incredibly wealthy family one of the top 20 wealthy families in this country yet he was a voice for the little guy and he went after these captains of industry they felt betrayed by the way you're one of us you're one of us you can't come after us come on teddy what else, what else, what else? He was a hunter, but a very, very staunch conservationist, which makes sense. Most hunters, all hunters have to be conservationists or they won't have anything to hunt, but he'll work very hard to protect animals and land in this country. What else about Teddy Roosevelt is so contrary? He was a boxer and a scholar, very athletic, but also very academic. He was a, by modern standards, a white supremacist, certainly a social Darwinist, but he will work hard. He will work hard in many respects to bring about uh, change and alleviate some, some, some of the suffering of black America. And that's why he's so interesting, at least to many people, because you, you never quite know when you're reading about Teddy or from Teddy directly, Teddy, like he's my friend, Mr. Roosevelt, um, where he's going to stand in a particular position, which is always more interesting than, than, than the opposite. He was born into incredible wealth in New York City. His, he's old blood, old blood. The Roosevelts had been in this country since the 1600s, very well connected. He goes to the finest schools 
Now, he was sickly as a child, and so he takes up athletics. He takes up athletics, very, very athletic, uh, including boxing. Throughout most of his life, he will remain uh, quite fit. He was said to have had his family crest tattooed on his chest. That's pretty rugged. That's pretty, that's pretty rugged. Now, as a young man, still in his 20s, he has entered politics, and something outrageously terrible happens to him. And this is a good lesson to everyone, I think. In 1884, still in his mid-20s, he's at work um, in New York State uh, Capitol, Albany. Um, he's part of the New York State Legislature. He's elected in his mid-20s. He comes home. He comes home and he's going to visit his mother and he's going home to his wife, the two loves of his life, his mother and his wife. Well, when he goes past his mother's house, he finds out that she had succumbed to typhoid fever. She's dead. He's gutted. He adored his mother and he races home. Now, his wife had just given birth to their daughter, Alice Lee. He comes home devastated from the loss of his mother, only to find out that she, on the same day, his wife of four years, had also passed of kidney disease. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine. This is the page from his diary, a simple X, and it says, the light has gone out of my life. He sends his daughter, Alice, to relatives, and rather than succumb to vice, rather than go to gambling, drugs, alcohol, he goes out west to the Dakotas. He becomes a rancher for a short time, and this is how he gets his head straight. Now, those terrible blizzards wiped out his ranch, but that's besides the point. He fought back. He didn't give up, and I sometimes think of that day when I'm having a bad day, and I think, and bad things happen to us all, certainly. What do you do now, right? What do you do now? Do you succumb to this horrible fate because it is random and it is terrible? Or do you press on and you rise above? Mr. Roosevelt rose above. He will return to New York after his stint as a rancher, and he will rise through politics, through the political machine as a Republican. For a time, he is the New York police commissioner, where he reforms the police department. He goes out on raids himself. He goes out on raids himself. Pretty cool for a politician to be kicking down doors and uh, helping to arrest people. Uh, is a lot of this for the public's consumption? Yes, very much so. Don't forget he's a politician. But still, but still, he becomes the assistant Secretary of the Navy in the late 1800s, and it is he that helps to build up our Navy, and it is he that helps to secure the Philippines as the undersecretary. We saw that in a previous lesson. He really captures the imagination of the American people when he becomes a rough rider out there. And again, I've said this before, but could you imagine a politician who actually goes and fights in a war that they helped to create? That is something that we have not seen since. Now, in 1900, in 1900, it is decided by McKinley, President McKinley, he needs a new vice president. He needs to replace his current vice president. There's an election year. And he decides on none other than this rising star, Teddy Roosevelt. At the Republican convention in 1900, a senator, takes McKinley to the side and says, don't you realize? Actually, I don't think it was McKinley. A senator spoke to another senator. Pardon me. I don't think it was directly to McKinley saying, uh, uh, don't you realize that there's only one life between this madman and the presidency? You see, Teddy is a loose cannon. We don't know which position he's going to take. And that's why so many people fell in love with him. He, 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 he was an unconventional character and he's still young and he's still full of energy. And now he's running for the vice presidency. This administration's promise promises have been kept. You voted for me in 1896 when I went against Brian vote for me again, this time with Teddy. 
Well, the American people spoke. And Brian, once again, Mr. Cross of Gold, did not get the presidency. We are going to remain Republican. And now we have McKinley slash Roosevelt in D.C. McKinley's tour, 1901. Shortly after his second inauguration, McKinley decides to thank the American people. He goes on tour to thank the American people for giving him a second round. He is to travel to the South, the Southwest, to thank the American people and give a series of, 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 of speeches. During these speeches, his security detail complained Mr. President, I, we don't like this. You're out there, out in among the crowd. It's very difficult to protect you. And McKinley says, I am an American president. I can't be anywhere than with the American people. Speech after speech was given, thanking the American people and promising four more years of commerce and civilization. This tour was to end in Buffalo, New York. And this is where fate again will play a cruel trick. The Buffalo Perrin American Exposition. At this exposition, the president speaks to a crowd at the Temple of Music on the exposition grounds. In attendance, in attendance was a young anarchist, a Polish immigrant who was determined to perform a propaganda of the deed. Yes, indeed. I'm not even going to attempt his last name. We'll call him Leon. We'll call him Leon. Leon had recently seen, uh, been witness to a speech given by Emma Goldman. Yes, the same Emma Goldman who helped to convince Berkman to attack and attempt to kill Frisk. Emma Goldman gave a speech on anarchy and propaganda on the de of the deed and young leon was convinced that this was his fate this was his destiny and so as president mckinley is greeting well-wishers at the temple of music leon approaches the president the x marks the spot where leon opens fire he had a gun hidden in a handkerchief and he opens fire on the president President McKinley shot by an anarchist at the Buffalo Fair. Two bullets fired at, by the assassin, but only one penetrates the body. Surgeons hopeful of recovery, an attempt made to lynch the cowardly murderer. In the end, McKinley succumbs to his wound, and we lose another American president. most cowardly of anarchists please keep this in mind because i've mentioned it before but i will mention it in the future this anxiety of who are we letting in to this country doesn't come from nowhere i'm not going to say that it's fat well-founded or unfounded but it doesn't come from nowhere again an immigrant anarchist has killed an american president this adds to this perception that we are letting very dangerous characters into this country and something needs to be done. This young man was uh, psychologically damaged to say the least. He had a criminal record. Um, he is imprisoned. He is found guilty of murder and he wins a date with the electric chair. This is the electric chair that took Leon from this earth. The aftermath. The American people were shocked. They were saddened. They were devastated. Mourners came out in the many thousands to D.C. to bury yet another American president. And now we have a brand new president. Now we have a brand new president. Mr. Roosevelt, who was our vice president, becomes our president. Entering the world's stage. Now I'm going to move a little bit away from aggressive movement. 
um, and just give you a little bit more about Roosevelt and what he believed about the United States. Roosevelt was an imperialist. You guys know this. Mr. Roosevelt was not afraid to throw America's weight around. Mr. Walk softly but carry a big stick, meaning, and he was that was a phrase that he was famous for, walk softly but carry a big stick. Use diplomacy, but be ready to use the military. We saw how Teddy Roosevelt prevented the Germans from embargoing the, or blockading, pardon me, Venezuela. But he also told Venezuela, pay up, right? A very big brother relationship with Latin America. Uh, perfect example of that is the building of the Panama Canal, which we covered fermenting rebellion in Panama because Colombia didn't want to play ball. During Roosevelt's presidency, another war raged. This one was between the Empire of Japan, a rising power, and the Empire of Russia, a power losing its stature in the world. This should have been an easy fight. Russia versus Japan. Now, because of a number of reasons, including racism, European powers knew that Russia was going to beat Japan. Of course, a European power is not going to be defeated by a East Asian power. That is impossible. Well, Japan had been rebuilding itself over the late 1800s following the Meiji Restoration, changing its government, modernizing its military, its schools. And Japan does the impossible. Japan actually destroys two of Russia's fleets, not one, but two of its naval fleets. 1904, Russia had all the esteem. 1905, Japan is a rising power. This Russo, Russo Japanese war, it's called the Russo, R U S S O, Japanese war, is important for two things. Number one, it shows that just because you're European, doesn't mean that you can win a war against a non-European. Get rid of that uh, 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 racialized view of, of the world. It's ridiculous. Number two, a rising power is Japan, and they expect to be taken seriously in the world, and that's going to lead to a number of issues, including the Second World War in the Pacific. What does Teddy Roosevelt have to do with this? What was Teddy Roosevelt who stepped in and brokered a peace between Russia and Japan? They, he stepped in. He's going to win a peace prize for this, by the way. Um, they meet in Portsmouth, Maine, to hammer out a peace treaty. Neither side is satisfied with this treaty. Neither side is satisfied with this treaty, which usually means it's a pretty good negotiation. It's a pretty fair balance. When both sides leave the negotiating table uh, somewhat unhappy, that's usually a sign of a good negotiation. And it was the Americans who oversaw this. This was a way of showing the world that we are entering the world stage. We are no longer the isolationists that we once were. We want to get involved. We are a rising power, and we expect to sit at, this, uh, at the table of great nations. That's why it's important from the American point of view. At the negotiations, the Japanese also have another major issue with the Americans that they want to hammer out. There is a major issue because Japan wants to be taken seriously on the world stage as well. And there's something going on that the Japanese do not like. And that has to do with the way Japanese American kids are being treated in San Francisco. They are being segregated. They are being put in Asian schools known as Oriental schools at this time with Koreans, with Chinese, with Filipinos. And they take umbrage with this. The Japanese do not see themselves as uh, on the same racial level as the Chinese or Koreans. They see themselves as much more above, and they want to make sure that their children, uh, even if they're Japanese-American, don't go to school in these Oriental schools. This is where a side deal is brokered. This is known as the Gentleman's Agreement of 1907. This is between the government of Japan and Teddy Roosevelt's American government. In the gentleman's agreement, both sides have an issue. The Japanese don't want Japanese kids in San Francisco to be discriminated against. Roosevelt is under a lot of pressure to end Japanese immigration into California. 
labor unions are very much against Japanese immigration into California. They feel that they drive wages down. And so they settle on an agreement. Japan will not issue any more passports for Japanese immigration into the United States. Now, people can get their wives or their families over if they're already here, but they're going to stop with most of the Japanese coming to California. They'll end it on their end. And the Americans, the American government will put pressure on the city of San Francisco to de- to pull Japanese out of these schools, not the Chinese, not the Koreans. This is just for the Japanese out of those schools to attend schools with white American students. This is the gentleman's agreement. Now, it was never written into law, but it was agreed upon and adhered to. This is a so-called Oriental school in San Francisco. The Japanese do not want their kids attending these. Interestingly enough, in South Africa, during apartheid, the Japanese also fought to not be considered non-white, and they achieved that. In those segregated beaches in South Africa in the 60s and 70s, the Japanese were exempt. The Great White Fleet. The Great White Fleet. How do you tell the world that America has arrived? This is a time before TV. This is a time before real cinema. This is a time before radio. How do you tell the world that America is a force to be taken seriously? What does Teddy Roosevelt do? He orders the U.S. fleet to sail around the world, literally to show the world our Navy, that we are a force to be reckoned with, that we have taken note of the influence of sea power upon history, and we are entering history. This is the Great White Fleet. It was named the White Fleet because they were painted on the sides, this stark white. And this was a way to show the world. Now, when I was a little kid in Spain, I got to see right before the invasion of the Americans, well, it was when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and I was a little kid. And the Americans had moved out their Navy into the Persian Gulf. And I got to see with my grandfather, part of the American fleet go through the Straits of Gibraltar, right where Africa meets Spain. There's a little opening. It went on for days, ship after ship after ship of the American fleet. And it was incredible. It was incredible. It was a real show of strength. And this is what Teddy Roosevelt's doing. He's showing what a big stick the United States has. We are to be taken seriously. This is the root of the great white fleet showing the world. Right here is where I got to see the American ships. They sailed through here. They would have went through the Suez and went around to the Persian Gulf. This is what I saw. The progressive president. Why is he called the progressive? progressive president he wanted to give the american people what he called was a square deal meaning i want to protect i want to equalize many of the inequalities many of the unjust uh, realities of american life through a number of measures i want to deliver to the american people reforms i want to regulate big business. I want to help organized labor. I want to protect consumers. I want to conserve our natural beauty. All of these things allowed Teddy Roosevelt to earn the name the progressive president. One of the first things he does is begin to trust bust, as it was called. He goes after monopolies, not all monopolies. He doesn't think all monopolies are bad, but he goes after certain monopolies, believing that it creates a uh, uh, an unfair consumer environment. Um, he goes after dozens of, of, of so-called trusts, the beef trust, the sugar trust, uh, the harvest store trust. He goes after several railroad trusts, busting them up, breaking them up, breaking up these monopolies, all in the name of protecting the little guy. But remember, please keep in mind, he doesn't think all trusts are bad, just the ones that are acting as monopolies. He introduces rail reform, very, very populist 
of him. Um, I won't go into the uh, uh, gritty details, but he helps to further regulate rail companies. He helps to create bigger teeth in American laws that go after rail companies for price gouging, for, for, for uh, questionable business practices. He is a tremendous believer that the rail companies have been taking advantage of the little guy, namely farmers out west. Finally, labor reform. Now, this is pretty revolutionary because up until Roosevelt, for the most part, the federal government had taken the side of the captain of industry. They had taken the side of the big guy against the little guy. And Teddy Roosevelt was one of the first, the first president to actively take the side, not always, of the little guy. There were several major strikes where when the bosses were pulling out of negotiations, refusing to budge, that Roosevelt put pressure on them saying, no, go back, talk to this man, talk to these people. This is a time where it wasn't fully legally protected to be a member of a, 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 of, of a union. You could be fired for trying to organize a union. Teddy Roosevelt said this, and this is revolutionary for its time. It is essential that there should be organization of labor. This is an era of organization. Capital organizes, and therefore labor must organize. What he means by capital, he means industry, the, capital, the, the, the capitalists, the captains of industry. The bosses organize, trusts, monopolies, etc. Why can't the little guy? Revolutionary, revolutionary. And again, many of America's wealthier individuals felt betrayed because they thought, Teddy, you're one of us. What are you doing? What are you doing? Conservation. Conservation. Teddy Roosevelt believed that, yes, Europe has cathedrals. Yes, much of the world has beautiful, beautiful, beautiful architecture. We're a young country. We don't have that. But what we do have is tremendous natural beauty. You might have Chartres Cathedral, but we have the Grand Canyon. You might have Westminster Abbey, but we have Yosemite Valley. However, over the 1800s, the West especially had become ranches, mining operations. Teddy Roosevelt saw the West disappearing and he wanted to conserve it. And so he, along with others, certainly worked very hard to put national lands to the side for future generations. During his presidency, Theodore Roosevelt protected approximately 230 million acres of public land. He put it aside in the form of national parks, in the form of uh, nature preserves, game preserves, national forests, national parks, 230 million acres put to the side for future generations. It's not ours, he said. It's not our generations to do with. This is something that we pass on to future generations. This belongs to everyone, past, present, and future Americans, this vast swath of natural beauty. Here is Mr. Roosevelt riding on a moose across a river. I was heartbroken when I found out that this was Photoshopped. This is not, in fact, this is not, in fact, a real photograph. This was Photoshopped. Um, again, you can see when you zoom in how fake it is. Uh, but nonetheless, nonetheless, did he ride across rivers on moose? No, he didn't. He did not. But he did help to preserve millions upon millions of acres. Here he is with John Muir in Yosemite Valley. Now, Yosemite Valley was actually before Roosevelt. Uh, but many national parks emerged because of Teddy. He helped to preserve the California Redwoods, among others. Our natural beauty is what sets us apart. These are national parks attributed to Theodore Roosevelt. Now, this doesn't give a good indication of how much land was actually preserved under his tutelage, however. Everything yellow here, everything yellow was before Roosevelt, but everything orange or peach uh, was during Roosevelt. Tremendous, tremendous swaths of land. Still with us because of Roosevelt and others. You see, government is stepping in to secure 
a standard of life for Americans. That's very progressive. The election of 1908. The election of 1908. Well, by 1907, Teddy Roosevelt is more popular than ever, and there's no law that says he can't run. Remember, the first time he is made president is because of McKinley's death. He runs a second time. However, he's promised not to run a third term. He's promised not to run a third term. He promised that in 1904, even though he's still very much young. He's still very much young. He instead decides to endorse his vice president and close friend, William Howard Taft. Taft was, in many ways, the opposite of Roosevelt. He was lumbering, big, 350 pounds of a man. He promises the American people, however, and Taft does too, a vote for Taft is a vote for me. He will continue Rooseveltian style rule, and he will continue to be a progressive. In the end, Taft wins. He's endorsed by President Roosevelt, and he wins the presidency. Roosevelt, still a young man, goes to Africa during this time where he hunts. He was a hunter. He hunted elephants. He hunted rhinos. It was Roosevelt that was responsible for the last living dinosaur being shot. Teddy Roosevelt was, he didn't know it was the last living dinosaur, but he shot and killed this Triceratops in modern day Botswana. Okay, that's not true. I used to say that and then not correct myself, but then a student was like, whoa, is that true? Uh, and I was like, oh, wait, I have to stop doing that. So this is, yes, this is Photoshopped. This one isn't. He used to ride a Velociraptor. That's just well known. But the other one, unfortunately, is a Photoshop. The Taft presidency. The Taft presidency, another one of those three progressive presidents. What does Taft do? Well, he pulls back on Teddy Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy, as it was called, and he switches to dollar diplomacy. He begins shelling out vast amounts of American aid, especially in Latin America, trying to convince countries to think along our lines. He strengthens the Interstate Commerce Commission, giving it even more teeth to regulate the rail companies. He also helps to regulate telegraphs and telephone companies. He also reforms the civil service laws, making uh, the spoil system even weaker. He was, he was a progressive president. He will file 90 lawsuits against monopolies in just four years. That's more than twice. That's more than twice what Roosevelt accomplished. He even successfully breaks up Standard Oil. His administration successfully breaks up Standard Oil into 34 new companies. Standard Oil meets its end. Rockefeller's behemoth meets its end under Taft. However, Taft then goes after J.P. Morgan's U.S. Steel. Teddy Roosevelt hears of this and he's shocked and he's disgusted. Remember, Teddy Roosevelt believes that some trusts are okay. U.S. Steel is okay. It's a good trust. In fact, Teddy Roosevelt was involved in uh, 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 helping U.S. Steel be formed. This, along with him being young and wanting to enter the uh, uh, political world, he's still in his early 50s, um, he decides to run in 1912. He decides to run in 1912, Theodore Roosevelt. Now, the Republicans have their man, Taft, and the party continues to support Taft. And so Theodore Roosevelt is forced to run under a new party called the Progressive Party. This is where things get confusing. I know I told you progressives could be Republicans or uh, Democrats or Progressive Party members, also known as the Bull Moose Party. Uh, Woodrow Wilson is the Democrat candidate the election of 1912 these three men it's a three-way race in fact really uh oh by the way this is where we get that image of teddy riding the moose this appeared in a newspaper you see taft is riding an elephant the animal of the republicans wilson is riding a donkey the animal of the uh of the democrats and the bull moose party well it has to be a moose He's riding the uh, moose. This is where that image first emerges, that Photoshopped image 
photo manipulation way predates computers. I hope you guys know that. The socialists even run. The socialists even run. They actually do pretty well in this race, surprisingly. It is during this, it is during this race that Teddy Roosevelt, again, proves himself to be cut from a different swath. He's just a different man than so many other politicians. October 14th, 1912, an unemployed saloon keeper shoots him while he's giving a speech. Does he stop? No. With a bullet lodged in his rib cage, he continues to speak for 90 minutes. Now, what he didn't know, because the bullet's in him, he doesn't know. He continues to speak to the crowd, which is amazing. This very lengthy speech that he wrote actually saves his life because it was folded up and placed in his breast pocket. And so when he's shot, the bullet is slowed down by not only the speech, but by his spectacle case. And so it does, in fact, lodge in his chest. He doesn't know that it's just there in the rib cage. There it is right over here. He continues his speech. And Americans love that. People love that. However, because the Republicans split the ticket, because Republicans in this country either voted for Roosevelt or Taft, Wilson, the Democrat, takes the White House. He doesn't have a popular majority, only 42 percent. So it's going to be difficult for him at first to to really to uh, really do everything he wants to do. Uh, but in the end, he will, for the most part. Uh, but because the ticket was split between Taft and Roosevelt, the Democrats now enter the White House. President Wilson, President Wilson. And those dates, by the way, I hope you know, those are their terms, not he was much older than <laughs> than that, than eight years. President Wilson, President Wilson. In just four years, four years, Wilson accomplishes a tremendous amount. He reduces the tariffs. He reduces the tariffs. Um, tariffs, import duties from other countries go from 40% to about 25%. He's reducing those tariffs. Now, this is how we made money as a country, those import taxes. How are we going to get money for the federal government? Well, Wilson does something else, which has its roots in the populist movement. Progressive policies become law under Wilson. Yes, indeed, our third progressive president. The 16th Amendment. The 16th Amendment introduces a progressive federal income tax on individuals and corporations. What does progressive mean? It means the more you make, the more you pay. It's progressive. It's not flat. This allows the federal government to lower tariffs, to lower import taxes, to allow cheaper products to come in from other countries, but also to raise money. This was central to the populist platform. The 16th Amendment introduces an income tax to individuals and corporations. The 17th Amendment. What does the 17th Amendment? It introduces direct elections for senators. Up until this point, it was state legislatures. This is what was in our Constitution. This is what the founding fathers wanted. It was state legislatures that decided who to send as senators to Washington to represent us. No, we want more of a direct democracy. We want to eliminate corruption in government. And we believe that if the people directly can elect our senators, we will reduce corruption and force our senators to be listening to us rather than those state legislatures. 17th Amendment, direct elections by the people of our senators. Up until this point, it was just the House of Representatives that were elected by the people, the lower house. The Federal Reserve Act, the Federal Reserve Act. Members of the populist movement had been begging for more government control and oversight over our banking system. And the Federal Reserve Act does just that. What it does is it introduces 
17 reserve banks, and it divides the country's banks into 12 distinct districts. Long story short, those banks remain private, but they are under the control of the Federal Reserve. We are introducing more government control over our banking. Foreign policy. Well, Wilson will carry on many of the Rooseveltian practices when it comes to uh, especially Latin America. Um, we will he will send troops to the Dominican Republic, uh, Cuba, Haiti, pushing around that big brother, little brother uh, relationship with Latin and Central America. Wilson's biggest headache, at least when it comes to Latin America, will be a revolution occurring just to the south of us in Mexico. And events in Mexico are going to drag us in. We are going to be dragged in. Um, let's briefly talk about the Mexican Revolution. Now, this is incredibly complicated. This is incredibly complicated. The history of Mexico is incredibly complicated, and I'm not even going to attempt to get in any sort of details when it comes to the Mexican Revolution. Just know that since independence in 1810, 95% of Mexico was controlled by less than 5% of the population. On average, on average in Mexico, life was incredibly difficult for your average individual. The ruling class exploited everyone else. And what started as a revolution in 1910 soon becomes a civil war, a five-way civil war between various factions battling for control of this country. Things will come to a head in Veracruz. America has placed an arms embargo around Mexico, saying no one can ship these different Mexican factions arms. The Japanese are sending weapons. The Germans are selling them weapons. Well, we tell the world, do not send any more arms into Mexico. There was a brief incident where American soldiers, who sailors who had landed in Mexico, uh, were arrested. Uh, they were later let go, but this greatly angered the Americans. Um, and it leads to it leads to the occupation of Veracruz. We occupy Veracruz, A, because of that insult of the arrests of American troops, and B, to prevent the Germans from sending more arms into Mexico. And so we, the United States, occupies Veracruz. This was an eight-month occupation. This does not go great for the Americans. It will lead to 126 dead Mexicans, 19 Americans. Uh, the United States has to declare martial law. Uh, Americans are attacked on the streets. Our popularity in Latin America drops way down, way, way down. In the end, in the end, we pull out. We pull out under pressure, and it's not going well. Um, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile, the so-called ABC powers, step in and negotiate a peaceful withdrawal. But this is America flexing. This is America showing the world that we don't care if it is a, a sovereign nation. We will invade a, a Latin American country in order to protect our own interests. This is not the first time, by the way, that American troops had invaded Veracruz. They did this in 1846 as well with the Mexican-American War. Many Mexicans resented this. They were raised on stories by their uh, fathers and grandfathers how the Americans occupied Veracruz and marched onto the capital. And so there was a lot of animosity during this occupation. Occupations, we learned, like in the Philippines, are incredibly difficult. It's one thing to defeat an army, but it's very, very, very difficult to defeat a populace. Love these old images of Americans in Veracruz.
American soldiers marching. Martial law meant that there were curfews. It meant that people were searched on the street. It meant that suddenly the Americans are an imperialist power. And again, it's very difficult to look good to the world as an imperialist power. Uh, newspapers in Latin America and Europe um, demonized and decried our actions in Veracruz. Many said it was far too heavy handed. All of this will lead to an attack on American soil, the infamous attack on Columbus, New Mexico. March 9, 1916, uh, General Pancho Villa, who is one part freedom fighter, one part bandit, sent an invasion force of 100 men across the border to attack Columbus, New Mexico. The goal, we're going to get some supplies, and we are going to maybe bring the Americans into this conflict because he knew that if the Americans get involved, it's going to destabilize things even. It's going to make things even more complicated. And the current government of Mexico that is dealing with all these rebels will succumb, will fall. It resulted in the deaths of 18 Americans and 80 of Pancho Villa's men. Other attacks were said to have happened across the border as well. They stole horses, guns, etc. America hadn't been invaded since the War of 1812. America hadn't been invaded since the War of 1812, but Pancho Villa did so. Pancho Villa, by the way, was a very remarkable. He was a very modern thinker. He understood the power of new media. Uh, if it was today, he would be very adept at social media. He literally used to call and invite uh, film crews. When he was going to raid a certain town, he would tell film crews, be there take pictures, uh, uh, record it on your moving motion cameras. And he dressed the part with the, with, 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 with the belts of, of ammunition. He, he, he looked like what he was a, a, a bandit general. There's the small town of Columbus. Wrecked. Ruined after being raided by Pancho Villa. This will all lead to a somewhat embarrassing episode, the Pancho Villa expedition. We want Pancho Villa dead or alive. And so what do we do? We send in American troops. We send in several thousand army regulars into Mexico to find and take, dead or alive, Pancho Villa. Now, we do kill about 160 of his men, two of his top generals, but we never get Pancho Villa. For two years, we kind of look a fool. We were under General John J. Pershing. This should have been easy, guys. A simple desert bandito. This should have been easy. It wasn't. It wasn't. He brought us deeper and deeper into the deserts and mountains of Mexico. We were somewhat limited on what we could accomplish in, a very reminiscent of the hunt for bin Laden in many ways. And with time, again, we look more and more foolish. Um, in the future, when I talk about Germany and it not taking America seriously, remember from the German perspective, you guys couldn't even catch a bandit out in the desert. Uh, why should we take you seriously? Just keep that in mind when we get to future events and the lead up to the First World War. This doesn't. This is right before America entering the First World War. This is during. This is during the Second World War that we are in Mexico, not doing well. We fly planes. We have armored cars. And we can't catch Pancho Villa. Battle after battle after battle, and we can't catch him. He's making us look foolish. There's General Pershing, tied up, lost in the deserts of Mexico. Now, in the end, Pancho Villa does meet his fate. Uh, long after the Americans pull out, assassins will rain down on Pancho Villa, killing him 
and his bodyguards, but that was a side beef, had nothing to do with us. Um, we couldn't accomplish it. We could not accomplish it. Before we end today, I just want to touch upon Wilson's record and civil rights. Many Black Americans were very hopeful of Wilson. Many supported Wilson in his run for the presidency. For his age, he wasn't considered a racist, uh, but by modern standards, certainly was a racist. Um, he's uh, a son of the South. He's from Virginia, although he'll later be a professor and the dean at Princeton. Um, he, first of all, believed that the North behaved badly following the American Civil War against the South during Reconstruction. Um, he, as the president of Princeton University, will try to dissuade black students from entering his college. He will oversee the House passing a law making interracial marriage illegal in the Capitol. He will also support uh, segregating the Navy in D.C., um, the uh, Treasury in D.C. And so a lot of the Black Americans will feel very much betrayed by Wilson. And during the progressive era, a new Black voice is emerging. Black America is going to undergo tremendous change during this time in America. And we will look at Black America in the progressive era in our next lesson. Thank you very, very, very much until we meet again.